All right, then, let's start this thing. Um, well, hello. Uh, hello, NDC London people. It's really nice to see you all. Um, firstly, well done for coming to this session. Good choice. I'm really pleased to see you are clearly people of good taste. So I'm, I'm quite happy to be spending the next hour with you. Um, so my name is uh, Steve, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to showing you this thing, Blazer. I'm sure some of you have seen it before, uh, but let's find out. Uh, can you do your hands in the air thing? If you've seen Blazer or Razor components, something like that before, oh, that's like three quarters of you at least. That's great. Um, just out of interest, how many of you went to Dan Roth's talk about Razor components this morning? That's like about third of the room as well. Okay, good. So you are going to see some overlap with this talk, but not too much, okay? There's going to be a lot of cool new stuff as well. Okay, so what is this thing? Why are we bothering to look at it? You know, for those of you who have not uh, heard about this before, um, Blazor is an experimental single-page application framework from the ASP.NET Core team, where we're building on the ability to run .NET code inside a browser in WebAssembly to give you the ability to be more productive and happy than ever before. That's the idea. OK. So in this talk, I'm going to be showing you quite a bit about how it how it works, you know, how you can build stuff with it, what the process of actually creating UI with this thing is. But there's also going to be quite a big part of, like, why are we doing this anyway? What is the point of this? Why should you care? What is changing in our industry that is creating this new possibility anyway? So to set that context, let's think a little bit about how web development works today, OK? So web development today you're going to have some code that runs on a server somewhere. Might be a server in the cloud, might be just some dusty box that's under your desk or something like that, but it's going to run some code, and that code might be in .NET, might be in Java, might be Node, might be Go, it might be something else, but it's some code running in a server. But you don't just want to write something in a server, you want to make some UI appear in someone's web browser. And how are you going to do that? Well, you're probably, today, going to use one of these single-page application frameworks. It's the most mainstream way of building a non-trivial UI. And whether it's Angular, React, Vue, something else, it's going to be running on the JavaScript runtime. Now, maybe you write your code in TypeScript or Flow or something else that compiles to JavaScript. But basically, it's running on the JavaScript runtime, so it's going to look and feel like JavaScript, which is a little bit of a shame, isn't it? Because this means you've got these two different worlds to try and make talk to each other. And not only that, it's just sad on a principle level. Because if, as an industry, we've built all these amazing languages and platforms, why can't we use them wherever we want? Why are we limited to this one little uh, cluster of languages around JavaScript in the browser? Wouldn't it be better if we could use anything we want anywhere we want? And that's the idea behind WebAssembly. Uh, WebAssembly is a way of running any code you want inside a browser. doesn't have to be JavaScript. We'll talk about how this works internally later in the talk. But just for now, let's say this is a great way of running whatever code you want, and it's supported in basically all browsers, including mobile browsers, um, at least as of about 18 months ago. So we're in good state with WebAssembly. So if we can run whatever code we want inside the browser on WebAssembly, that naturally leads us to think, well, could we run .NET inside the browser on WebAssembly? And when we found out that we can do that, that brings us very happily to Blazor, which is a UI platform built on top of this stack. So this is for you to build your sophisticated UIs on top of .NET running inside a browser. OK, so would anyone want to do that? Well, would there be any benefits? Who should want to do that? Why would we care? So there are potentially quite a number of advantages to doing this versus traditional approaches to building your web UIs. And I'm going to go through some of them, but you don't want to just hear me keep talking about this. You want to actually see it for yourself, presumably. So I'm going to show you some examples of each of these things just now. Let's start with the advantages of using the c -sharp language inside a browser. OK, so I'm going to switch over to a demo application now. And I've got this Blazor application here that I can start up and run inside my browser. OK, so uh, it's a pretty tr traditional, typical looking web application. Uh, it's got a couple of different pages in it. We've got a to-do list. We've got this thing where we can fetch some weather forecasts from the server. Um, and we can do some forward, backward, client-side navigation. And it's all interactive. So let's have uh, make Blazor profit. OK, so that's my to-do list. And it's all working fine. 
um, and it's interactive inside the browser. Sort of thing you would normally use uh, a JavaScript framework to build, but we're not using JavaScript here at all. So if we have a look at what's inside our solution here, you'll see what we've got is a bunch of CSHTML files, which is Razor. We'll talk about that in a second. And besides that, we've got CSS, we've got HTML, and we've got traditional C Sharp files, but no JavaScript because we don't need it, because we've compiled .NET and we've, uh, we've run it in such a way that it can run inside the browser. Okay? Um, so what are these CSHTML files? Well, if you've done any ASP.NET development in the last few years, you'll be familiar with CSHTML being Razor files. Now, Razor is a syntax for combining C Sharp and uh, HTML in one file in a way that they can work together really nicely. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. OK, so firstly, how does this very simple thing on the home screen work? It's just some static content. So how do we make some static content show up in our Blazor application? Well, we make a component. In Blazor, all parts of your UI are components. The whole application is a component. Pages are components, layouts are components, groups of UI elements. They're all components. It's components all the way down. So that's what each one of these CSHTML files is. And the simplest component is very simple indeed. It's just some markup, just static markup. Uh, but what's this? OK, so up at the top, we've got this one special thing, which is a directive. And the page directive says, this is the component that we want to use if the user is on the home page. And we're going to display this static markup. So that's pretty simple. OK, uh, what about the slightly more interesting thing of this to-do list, OK, where we can actually enter some stuff and the UI updates? Well, let's look at the code for to-do list. There's quite a bit more in here, but I think we can understand this quite easily. Let's go through it. So firstly, we've got the page directive up at the top, again, to control which URL we respond to. And ignore this stuff for a minute. Down here, we've got a functions block. And inside the functions block, we can put some code. And since this is .NET and we want to write this in C Sharp, we are writing some C Sharp code right here inside our component. So how does it work? Well, we've got this text box here which says, whatever value you enter, we're going to put this in this field called new item text, which is defined down here. OK? And then this form says, when you submit it, we're going to call this method add item, which is a C sharp method defined down here. And we'll take the item that you've just typed in, and we add it to our list of items, which is a list of string. And then we want the box to get cleared out, so we'll set new item text back to null. OK, and then all that's left to do is iterate over all the items in our items list. And for each one, we'll just display it on the screen. So I hope you will agree that this is a pretty simple way of writing interactive UI. OK, very simple, familiar components based programming, but with .NET combined with HTML. All right. So last one that I want to show you as an example is this one where we're fetching the list of weather forecasts. Now, this is to demonstrate how we can interact with some external services to get data. And if we look at the code in there, you'll see, again, we use this page directive. But we're also now using inject. Inject lets us interact with ASP.NET's dependency injection system so that we can get services uh, that are defined within our application. And in this case, we're getting an HTTP client so that we can make some calls to fetch some data. OK, now we'll ignore all this stuff for a minute, and let's look down here. And we can see that when this component is first initialized, it's going to asynchronously do an HTTP GET request to some endpoint to fetch some data. Now, as it happens, it's just a static file that I've got in disk. Uh, but it could be anything. It could be some dynamic code that runs on the server. And when the response comes back, we're going to deserialize it as an array of weather forecasts. And I've defined the weather forecast type right there. So then we want to display that on the screen. And if we wanted to, we could do it in a similar way to how the to-do list works. We could have a for each loop, and we could say, for each item, I want to make an HTML table row, and I'll display the contents in that. And that would work perfectly fine. But I wanted to make this a little more interesting. So I've got this component called MDC list. What on earth is that? Well, you will see that my application has this attractive kind of purple theme and uh, this pretty list here. Well, this is all coming from the material design library. Okay. So this is to show you that in Blazor, we can pull in component libraries that have got ready-made components for us. So I've got this material design components list, and I can pass my forecast to it, and I can pass all these other little template parameters that control how stuff get displayed in the list there. All right. So that shows us how we can use C Sharp in a remarkably simple way to build interactive UI. 
But what's this next thing then? The .NET ecosystem. How can we make use of the .NET ecosystem inside a Blazor application? Well, consider the following scenario, okay? It's Monday morning. You've been working all weekend and you've made this weather forecast thing and you excitedly show it to your boss or some kind of business analyst in your company and they go, well done, Code Monkey. you've done a good job. Um, but there's one little thing that I need from you. Um, I need to be able to export this to Excel so that I can do some business analytics on it. And you'll think, oh, great, I have to export to Excel. Um, OK, fine, I'm going to make you a CSV file. I can, I can output a comma-separated text file that's going to be good. And the business analysts will say, no, I don't want a CSV file. I want a proper spreadsheet. I want colors. I want conditional formatting. I want charts. This is my life. Don't take it from me, OK? I want a real spreadsheet. And you'll say, oh, great, right, how am I going to make a real spreadsheet? Um, and the answer to that is really easily, OK? Because you're a .NET developer and you've got access to the whole .NET ecosystem. And doing things like making spreadsheets is super easy. So how are we going to do it? Right, we're going to go and we're going to add a reference to an external third party package, OK? So let's go to NuGet.org and we're going to search for Excel, all right? And what's going to come back from there? A bunch of things that help us to work with Excel. And if we look closely, the one thing that's got by far the largest number of downloads, 5.86 million of them, is this thing called EP+. So you say, OK, it's got a lot of downloads. Therefore, it must be the right thing for me to use. So I'm going to install that into my application right now. And it says, OK, accept some terms. Yep, great. Uh, I don't want you to read me. Thank you. And now I've got the power to make Excel spreadsheets. So what do I want to do? First, I want to make a button that appears at the bottom of the screen here for downloading this as a spreadsheet. So I could use a traditional HTML button if I wanted to. But hey, since I've got this material design thing, I'll use an MDC button so that it looks good. And then Visual Studio says, hang on, you want me to invoke this download as spreadsheet? Well, sorry, but there is no such thing, and that's going to be a problem. So you'll say, OK, fine, right, I'm going to create this download as spreadsheet method that we're going to invoke when they click the button. OK, what am I going to do in there? Well, I better put some logic in it. So you'll go and you'll read the documentation for EP+, and it will tell you that what you need to do is new up an Excel package, and then you can do stuff, like you can add a forecasts tab into the list of worksheets in this spreadsheet. And then we're going to say, all right, browser, I want you to download this thing as a file called forecasts.xlsx, and the contents will be the bytes from that spreadsheet that we've just created on the client in our application. Application. So let's load that now and let's see if when I press this download button, does it download a real spreadsheet? Okay, it says, okay, you're opening forecasts. Do you want to open that in Excel? Yes, of course. So I choose yes and Excel starts doing all its stuff. And when that comes up, hopefully we'll get a forecast. Now, uh, it's empty, right? There's nothing in our spreadsheet because I didn't put any data in it. But we have got this forecasts tab down here, which starts to show that we're on the right track. So what do we want to put inside our spreadsheet? So again, you go back to the EP plus docs and you read how to go about inserting data and such. And we'll decide that what we want to do is we want to start at this cell B2, B2, and then we can use a C sharp link query to fetch whatever data we want from our uh, in-memory weather forecast array. And we can use link expressions like where f dot temperature is greater than 100 or whatever. That'd be a hot day, that one. And OK. so. Uh, we fetched our data and we have put it inside our spreadsheet. Okay, but we can do some more cool stuff than that. Let's make this a little bit more interesting. So first, let's add a computed column here in our spreadsheet where we're using this formula to calculate temperature in F based on temperature C. Very good. And let's also dump in loads of code that you won't have time to read that's going to set horizontal alignment, background color, and bold fonts, and other things like that. All right, and then finally, just to really show off, let's put in a chart, okay? Just because that's what our uh, business analysts really wanted. So let's go back and try that now. So if I hit the download button, then again, it's gonna say, you're opening this uh, forecasts spreadsheet. And when that comes up, this time, instead of being empty, we've now actually got our data and it's got colors and it's got uh, formulas. It's even got this completely insane pie chart that shows like how much of the temperature happens on each day of the week, whatever that <laughs> means. Okay. Um, so there we go. We've done a super job there of pulling in a thing, just an arbitrary third-party thing from the .NET ecosystem, and we were able to use it inside our application. All right. Last benefit 
Full stack, what on earth do we mean by that? Why is that a relevant term in this context? Okay, so the application I've shown you so far is a true client-side web application. It does not have any dependency on there being .NET on the server at all. You could host this on a PHP site if you wanted. You could more realistically host it on Node or, or some other kind of modern framework. Or if you wanted to, you could export it all and you could deploy it to GitHub Pages or to Azure Blob Storage or to some other static file store. There's no requirement for there to be .NET on the server. But what if you do have .NET on the server? Are there potentially some advantages that you can use to tie your front end and your back ends together in a useful and interesting way? So let me show you. I'm going to close this project right now, and I'm going to switch over to a different version of it that's almost the same, except this one is going to be based on an ASP.NET Core server. So let me just run it first so that we can see that this works. And that's not in any way what I wanted to run. Let's uh, set the, this thing as the startup project, and we can close all our windows. There we go. All right, so let's start this up. Uh, when that comes up, you'll see that it's basically the same thing that we had before. Um, it's got the same set of components in it, the same pages, the same basic behavior. Um, so we've got all this stuff. Um, but if we look at our source code, there's now three projects instead of one. We've got the client project, which is basically the same thing that we had before. So this is another Blazor client-side WebAssembly application. It's got the same set of pages and components and stuff. It behaves the same as before. But we've also now got a server project, and that is an ASP.NET Core server. And we can use that as a place to put things like our backend data services that we want to invoke, or any other things that we need a server for, like authorization or you know, database access, that sort of thing. Okay? And then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, we've got this shared project. And this is a really basic thing. It's just a .NET standard 2.0 class library, which you can just put any code in that you want to share between your server and your client. Because I've set up references from the client project and the server project both to this shared. So they both get whatever code is in there. And as an example, I've put the weather forecast type in there. So now, if I go and look at the forecasts on the client here, you'll see that before, I had the forecast defined as an inline class here. So the client was defining its own weather forecast type. But now it doesn't. It just gets that from the shared project. And similarly, on the server, uh, the endpoint that we're calling, this sample data controller weather forecasts thing, which is going to return the data, well, it doesn't define weather forecasts either. It gets that from the shared project. So the point is, whatever stuff we want to share between server and client, we just stick it in here, and it's there. And it's not just for data. You can also use that for bits of logic as well. Here I've got some logic that computes temperature uh, Fahrenheit based on the C. And I could also put in things like validation rules or other business logic that we want to share between client and server in an incredibly straightforward manner. OK. So those are three uh, ways in which it can be really nice to build this kind of application. But there are various other benefits that we could talk about as well. Uh, you know, performance, .NET Core on the server is just about the fastest uh, mainstream web platform that there is. Uh, if you can check the uh, independent tech and power benchmarks if you want to verify that sort of thing yourself. It's extremely fast. Um, we've, got, we've always had the best-in-class tooling, pretty much. Microsoft has been well known for, uh, for having really outstanding industry-leading tools in Visual Studio with the IntelliSense and debugging and all that kind of stuff. So you know, all that stuff comes with it. And then finally, in terms of stability, well, in .NET world, the culture is basically we assume that your projects are going to be around for like five years or 10 years or something like that. So we try really hard to keep things stable over that kind of period. And we're not just completely changing what set of libraries you're supposed to use every three months. Now, stuff does change sometimes. But um, generally, it's a, it's a more stable world than you might see in, say, JavaScript land. OK. So that gives you some ideas about what this stuff is all about. but. I haven't really shown you much about how it works on the inside yet. So the way this stuff works is that we've got three technologies stacked up on top of each other, making this sort of technology cake that we're able to enjoy and feel delighted by. Okay. So at the bottom of our technology cake, we're building this stuff on WebAssembly. And I've said to you already that WebAssembly is a way of running whatever kind of code you want inside a browser. But how does that work? Okay. 
Well, WebAssembly is a bytecode format. That's what the spec is. It says that here's a way of describing some programs in a low-level bytecode, and browsers are supposed to implement support for executing it. And the good news is they have implemented support for doing that. All the mainstream ones, including uh, mobile ones, have done that. But what does this bytecode look like? You may well never have actually seen the bytecode itself, or maybe you've uh, seen it, but you wouldn't really know how to create it yourself. So let's have a go. I'm going to create a, a small WebAssembly application right now. Well, calling it an application might be a stretch um, because it's going to be very, very simple, OK? And this has got nothing to do with .NET, doesn't use Blazor. This is just going to be pure WebAssembly on its own so that you can understand that. Right, so what I've got here in this directory is a few files, uh, including Fibonacci.c. I expect you can probably guess what that does, but let me show you. It's a simple C program that is going to compute the Fibonacci sequence, which is just uh, a series of numbers that are defined mathematically. It goes 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on. After that, I can't add. But um, that's how it works. And my print Fibonacci function is simply going to take the number of terms that we want to print, and it's going to say, OK, as long as you've got some more stuff to do, then I'm going to print out the current term. I'll compute the next one. I'll print it. I'll compute the next one. I'll print it, and so on, until we run out of things to do. So that's written in C. And as you know, C doesn't normally run inside web browsers. But thanks to WebAssembly, we can compile C to WebAssembly and then run it. So let's have a go at that. So I'm going to show you. These are the files that we've got right now. But I'm going to compile Fibonacci.c using the mscripten C compiler to produce something that can run inside a JavaScript runtime. OK, so that compiles. It takes a few seconds. And when that's done, you'll see we've now got these two new files, Fibonacci.js and Fibonacci.wasm. WASM, WebAssembly, is the actual binary bytecode format. So we can't read that directly. It's just binary stuff. Um, but I'll show you what's in there in a second. And the JS one is a wrapper file that, is enabled, that intends to help you load it and run it inside the browser. Now, that's what I want to do. I want to run it in my browser. Uh, so I've got this index.html file that I can load in my browser. And to show you what's in there, well, it's extremely minimal, not really even valid technically, but it's going to work. And it's going to load this Fibonacci.js file and then run it. So let's set up a little static HTTP server that I can use to um, execute that stuff. And then I'll go back to my browser, and I'll go to localhost port 8080. And we'll have a look in the browser console. And we should see that, indeed, it is actually printing out those first 10 terms of the Fibonacci series. So we're running C inside the browser. But how does it work? What's going on, really? Um, so we'll have a look in the, the debugger. And actually, in order to make this easier to understand, I'm going to recompile this uh, with uh, additional debugging support. So I've, I'm compiling in debug mode, and I'm going to emit source maps as well. And once I've done that, and I go back into my browser and reload, you'll see now we see Fibonacci.c shows up in the DevTools. And if we click on that, we can see our C source code here, which is, it, which is the stuff that we're running. And I can even do things like set a breakpoint on there. So if I hit reload, we'll now hit that breakpoint, and it appears that we're stepping through C code that's executing inside the browser, which is pretty cool. Um, but we're not really actually executing C at all. What we're really executing is the WebAssembly bytecode, and it's just been mapped to this source code by the source maps. So let's have a look at the actual bytecode. Uh, we can see that in here. Now, normally, the WASM file on disk is a binary file that you can't possibly read. But Firefox is kind enough to represent it to us in this kind of human-readable format. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that you have to be the right kind of human to read this. But I think that we are the right humans to read this. We can do this, all right? So what is inside this crazy-looking thing? Well, we can see it's got all these function imports and exports. But I don't really know what that most of that stuff is. Let's just search for print. Fibonacci. OK, so we can see here's our code. This is the thing that we were writing. And what does it do? Well, uh, all these instructions, what are they? If you look closely, you might see that that's kind of similar to the .NET uh, instruction language, MSIL. Uh, it's a, just like MSIL, it's a stack-based virtual machine that operates on a fixed set of primitive types. And so we can compile whatever code we want to to this format as long as you've got the right kind of compiler for it. And the sort of thing it can do is it can do things like define functions. It can have locals. It can do loops. It can do these numeric operations, like subtracting one. Um, and it can call out to system functions, like here is where it's calling the printf thing. Okay. So given that, we can even set breakpoints inside WebAssembly as well. 
So let's do a reload on there. And we should see that we've uh, hit some breakpoints and we can start stepping through the actual WebAssembly code as well. All right. So I hope that somewhat makes sense to you, that that's what's at the bottom of the stack here. We're able to compile stuff to this bytecode format. It then runs inside the browser. And WebAssembly is really fast. One of the key design goals for WebAssembly from the beginning has been performance. And generally speaking, code that's compiled to WebAssembly runs within a factor of two of executing just natively, if you compile it to native x64 machine code or whatever else that you normally target. OK, so that's the idea with WebAssembly. And given all that, we might think, well, right, let's run some .NET on that. How are we going to run .NET in it? Well, the obvious way to run .NET on WebAssembly would be to somehow compile the .NET uh, machine code, the MSIL, to WebAssembly bytecode. Okay? If we could somehow do that, then we could just run it inside the browser. So that would be cool, but that's not actually what we've done. What we've done instead is we've taken a .NET runtime and we've compiled that to WebAssembly. So we're not compiling your code to WebAssembly. We've already compiled the runtime to WebAssembly. And the runtime that we've compiled is, in fact, mono. And you might think, why mono? Why did you? Why mono? Uh, the answer to that is that Microsoft has got three .NET runtimes that we ship right now. We've got the .NET Framework, uh, which is uh, the CLR. We've got .NET, .NET Core, Core CLR. And then we've got Mono. And these all have different places and different purposes. The idea is that for you as a developer, you don't have to care which of these things your code is running on. You code against .NET standard, and your code is going to run on any of them just the same. But why did we pick Mono for this then? Well, it's because Mono is our preferred .NET runtime for portable client scenarios. Mono is a really portable code base. And so it was the, by far the most practical one for us to compile to WebAssembly. So that's what we've done. And that is something that the .NET team, uh, sorry, that the Mono team is committed to shipping uh, as a fully supported production runtime uh, so that you can run uh, your .NET code inside the browser on WebAssembly. OK, but how does it work? Right, I've just told you that this thing exists, but I've not really shown it to you. So let me show you a little bit of Mono running in, on top of WebAssembly. And I can show you that inside the application that we've been building already. What are we actually sending to the browser? How does the browser know to load Mono and to execute our .NET code inside it? Let's have a look at the HTML source code. All right, so our HTML that we're sending to the browser is just normal HTML. It's got a bunch of CSS and body tags and things like that. Uh, we've got this um, loading animated progress bar, which is just static HTML that I've put in there. But nothing really interesting happens until we get to the bottom here, where we load this JavaScript file, components.webassembly.js. And that is something that's built into Blazor. So when you create your new project with Blazor, that thing is already there. You don't have to see it. We just know how to serve that. And that file is what knows how to start up Mono and load your application into it. So let's see what the browser is really doing. If we open up the Network tab here, and I'm going to hit Reload, uh, then we'll look closely at what stuff this thing has actually sent down to the browser. So we've sent that initial HTML that I just showed you, and that contains instructions to load various things like CSS. And then it loads components.webassembly.js, and that tells it to do a few more things to start up your application. And importantly, it loads mono.wasm. And that's what I told you we've done with Mono. We've compiled it to a WebAssembly binary using mscripten, the same way that I compiled Fibonacci.c to Wasm. The same thing has happened with the Mono code base to make this file. Okay? And then once that's been loaded, we can load your regular .NET assemblies into it. So we're not compiling these to WebAssembly. They're just normal .NET DLLs that have been built by the normal c -sharp compiler. And we can load them and run them inside the Mono runtime, which itself is running on WebAssembly. Right. So you may be thinking, hang on, you're loading an entire .NET runtime into the browser. This is going to like hundreds of megabytes or something? How big is this thing? And the answer to that is, currently, it's about two megabytes. So for a .NET runtime, that's really small. And we're quite pleased with that. But at the same time, we're not pleased with it, because two megabytes is big for a web page. And there are a lot of scenarios where you want your application to be quite a bit smaller 
than two megabytes. Maybe you are building some kind of internal line of business app and it doesn't matter to you at all. We hear a lot of customers say like, I don't care if it's 10 megs, that's fine with me. Um, but if you're trying to do some public facing thing, you probably want it to be smaller. So we're working quite hard and the Mono team is working hard on finding ways of cutting that size down. But you know, two megs is where we've got to at the moment. Of course, this is all cached. So if the user comes back later, they're not gonna fetch any of that stuff a second time. I only downloaded uh, 227 kilobytes this time and that's because I'm not even caching various things to do with Bootstrap and other stuff. Uh, you can make the size down to kind of nearly zero when it's cached, but it's two megabytes if it's not cached. Okay, so that's how we're running Mono on top of WebAssembly. Final thing, the top most and most delicious most layer of our technology stack is Blazor, and that is the UI framework that we've been using. So that is the thing that is defining not only how our application starts up, but what all our components are uh, and how they're able to interact with each other. Right, so I've shown you a bunch of components already, but I've only shown you some fairly simple ones. You're an advanced and ambitious kind of group of people, I think. So wouldn't you like to see some advanced components? I think you would. So let's go through two scenarios where we can build some more interesting things with components, okay? We're gonna start with something that sounds very smart indeed, templates and generics. How can we make some generic templated components? Well, what I want to show you is, let's look at this thing here. I mentioned earlier that I'm using this MDC list, okay? Now, what is that? And how could we make our own special list components ourselves? This, remember what it looks like? It's displaying this attractively formatted list with icons and subtitles and things like that. And that's all coming from this external component library. But what if we wanted to do this ourselves? What if we didn't have MDC list? Let's get rid of it and implement it ourselves, shall we? So I'm gonna show you what the equivalent inline code would be. It's kind of scary. You're not gonna like the way it looks, but this is how it is. If we wanted to make this uh, material design list just by ourselves, we'd create an unordered list and we'd put this massive pile of unpleasant looking CSS classes on it. And then we'd say, okay, for each of the weather forecasts, we'll iterate through it and then we'll make more and more markup during which we'll display the icon and the date and the temperature and other things like that. So let's see if our homemade material design list works just the same as the, the predefined one. So let's come back and reload. And it should render more or less the same thing. It's slightly different. It's not displaying the temperature in Fahrenheit anymore. But you know, it's basically the same thing. I just didn't make it exactly the same. OK, so we can do this ourselves. But once we've done this, we don't want to keep reinventing this every time. We want some way of reusing this component over and over again, the general idea of a material design list. So, how can we make our own list component? I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna add a new item, and I'm gonna choose, where is a view, and I'm gonna call it super list. All right, so what can I put in my super list? Well, the first thing is, let's think about what data our list is gonna need. We want to be able to pass in the list of things to be rendered, okay? So I'm gonna define a parameter on my list here. A parameter is just a property that's uh, got this special parameter attribute, and I can pass in an innumerable of weather forecasts that we want to render. And then I'm gonna put some initial markup inside this component. And it's gonna be the same thing that we saw before. So it's gonna have all these CSS classes, and it's gonna say for each one of the things, I'm gonna display something, and initially I'm just gonna display the date. All right, so let's keep it simple to get started with. And then over here on the consumer side, let's get rid of all that markup, and I should see in IntelliSense, if my IntelliSense was alive, it's there, yeah? So I've got my super list here, and I can start making use of that. Okay, but I want to pass in the list of forecasts to it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Let's save that, I'm gonna rebuild, and then we'll check that we are actually using our super list component. Now remember, super list only displays the dates, and it does so in a very basic and rubbish fashion. So we've got some more work to do. Firstly, I do not want to display the dates in this format. I want to be able to customize the format. So what can I do here? Well. I could have a parameter where you pass in a format string or something like that, but I want to be even more advanced than that. I want to be able to pass in some arbitrary markup that describes the way that the uh, title is going to be rendered, this primary text. So I'm gonna define another parameter here, and it's gonna be called title, 
and the typing of it might be a little bit unfamiliar. So it's going to be of type render fragment. That's a special type that components know about, and that represents an arbitrary piece of user interface. So the person using the component can pass in whatever markup they want, which can contain logic or other components, and we're able to render it from here. So now, uh, instead of just rendering item.date, I'm going to invoke title, and I'm going to pass the item into it. It's a generically typed render fragment which operates on a weather forecast. So I'm going to call it, and so we'll render whatever markup has been passed in for each item. And now, if I go back um, onto the consuming side here, I should be able to specify a title, okay? And I can put in here whatever I want to, uh, using this magic keyword, context, okay? And if I type that correctly, like, let's make sure I've got the type correct, and I try to type context, then, IntelliSense should say, OK, I know what that is. That is going to be a weather forecast. So I'll prompt you with what all the properties that are on weather forecast. OK? So I want to display the date, and I want to be able to display it in a particular format. So I'm going to pass a format string here to control that it gets rendered like this. Right, let's try this out. Let's see if we're now rendering our um, dates in a more attractive format. So we reload, and indeed, we are now displaying it in the way that we wanted, okay? But I don't just want to display the date. I want to display things like an icon and summary text and other things like that. So I'm going to go back to my super list, and I'm going to say, you can pass in as many different templates as there are things to do useful stuff with. So I'm going to say we're going to have an icon template, a subtitle, and actions, and we're going to make use of all those in the rendered output. So let's get rid of this, and I'm going to just paste in a big chunk of stuff that displays the icon and the title and the subtitle and all that stuff. OK? And then back over here on the caller side, I can now pass not just a title, but I can pass all the other stuff the icon, the summary, I'm displaying the temperature in this particular format that I'm controlling over here when I use my super list. Okay, let's try this one more time. Reload, and now we should see, okay, great, it's looking good. We're displaying the icons, we've got these things over here on the right. We've got pretty much a reusable list. But it's not completely reusable yet, because at the moment it's completely hard-coded to work with weather forecasts. What about if we want to render other things that are not weather forecasts? And this is where generics come into it. So generic components are very, very cool. You can do this. I can say, I want to declare a type param here, and I'll call it t item. And that's just like a generic parameter on a C sharp class. And so now, instead of using weather forecast, I'll say, OK, give me an enumerable of T items and also a bunch of templates that, in a strongly typed way, operate on T item. OK? And now I can render anything I want. So then I can go back over here to where I use it, and I can specify what I want T item to be. So let's say I want T item to be a weather forecast, all right? So now I can pass this list of weather forecasts in, and VS knows that each one of these things is going to be a weather forecast. So we get the right IntelliSense, OK? But what's cooler still than that is, what if we don't specify what the type is? Well, that's great too, because we've got generic type inference. We don't have to specify what it is. The fact that the parameters we've passed give us enough information to know what the generic type is means that it's just going to work anyway. So we still have all the correct IntelliSense showing up, and we are very happy people. Okay? Last thing we might want to do is, uh, it's a bit strange that we've got this word context here. Like, what is that? Why is that the right word? So let's say we want to change that for something else. Let's say I want the variable to be called forecast instead. And now VS is going to say to us, what is this context thing you're speaking of? I don't know what that is, but I do know what forecast is, because forecast is now the name for each item here. So I can change all these contexts to forecast, and the code starts to make a lot more sense. So we've pretty much completely recreated everything that we had in the MDC list component, and we've made our own reusable list. It's not limited to working with um, weather forecasts. It can work with anything. All right, so that's one type of advanced component. Let me give you another one. What about this, cascading state? What is that? It also sounds pretty advanced, right? So all the components I've shown you so far, they contain their own state. They just deal with their own little world, and they don't have to interact with other components in any way. But what if you need to have a way of coordinating state across all the different components in your application? 
Well, there are many ways you can do that. Because this is just a .NET application, you can use whatever patterns you want with C Sharp and events and statics or dependency injection, whatever it is that you want to do. But Blazor or components, the underlying UI technology, have got a good feature for this that help you to coordinate state across your application. So as an example of that, let's uh, imagine that I want to make my application themable. I've got this purple button here, but what if I want it to be different colors at certain times? And I don't want all my components to embed information about themes. I want to just define that in a central place. So I'm going to add a new class, and I'm going to call it theme info. And I can put whatever properties on here I want to represent uh, stuff that I can theme. And what I'm going to put in is just this one thing called button class. I could put more stuff in if I wanted to, but that'll do for now. All right. And now I want to be able to pass an instance of this to all the components in my application. So I could do this wherever I want, but I'm going to go to my main layout and I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to use this built in thing called cascading value. And that can provide a value to all the parts of my UI that are inside this element. And VS is saying, what do you want me to pass? You haven't said. So I'm going to say what I want to pass is not that. What I want to pass is this. I want to pass a new theme info. OK, so I'm creating a theme info. And I'm saying the initial button class is this button warning thing. And I'm passing that to all the other parts of my application. And so then I can receive a theme info wherever I want to. I'm going to go over to my to-do list, which we saw earlier, and I'm going to make a parameter where I can get that current theme. Now, as you know, normally we use parameter to get parameters, but this is not a normal parameter. This doesn't just come from my parent. This comes from anywhere in the hierarchy above me. So I'm going to have a cascading parameter. And so we can get the current theme cascading down through the UI. And then up here on my button, instead of using button normal, I'm going to use current theme dot button class. So whatever it is that's on my theme. So let's build that now. OK, I'm going to come over and hit reload. And so now instead of that purple button, you can see we've got a different colored button because that's coming from the theme which we've been sharing. So that is how we can supply static content. But cascading value is cool because it's not just static stuff we can pass, but also stuff that changes. So let's say I want to make this button class change. I'm defining it as a field with an initial value of button normal, and I'm going to use that. And then, so that the user can edit it, I'm going to put in a drop down list. And it's going to be wired up to that button class. So whatever you choose from here, that's going to be the value for this field. And there's a few different options that we can use. OK, so now if I start my application again, the button is going to go back to being purple because that was our default theme. But if I change it here, I can have orange or I can have blue. And that theme information just automatically gets distributed through my application. I don't have to think about subscribing for changes or anything like that. The state is able to flow correctly throughout my tree of components. Great. So there we go. There's two advanced scenarios for components. Now, that's all very well, but this is stuff that we've already shipped. If you've been using Blazor for the last few months, you've probably already seen that stuff. And what you, maybe you would like to see is stuff that we have not shipped yet. What's coming soon? What are we working on? All right, so I'm going to show you a few things now. So uh, let's start with debugging. Now, we've already got some debugging support. We can already do some debugging in a browser. If you were in Dan's talk earlier this morning, you will have seen that. I'm going to do a very quick recap of what we've already got. Uh, just for anyone who hasn't seen that. So I'm going to switch over to Chrome, because that's the browser we're supporting debugging in right now. And I'm just going to make sure that I've cleaned my application, and I'm going to rebuild it, everything to give me the best chance of success here. And then I'm going to start my application up when it's rebuilt. And then hopefully, I'm going to show you how we can do some debugging inside the browser. So I'm going to go over to Chrome, and um, I'm going to start my application up. And I think, all right. How am I going to do this debugging then? Because I can't really use VS, because VS doesn't know about Chrome you know, and web, application, web assembly applications. And I can't really use the browser dev tools, because they only show me things to do with CSS and JavaScript and things like that. So how can I debug .NET code? 
Well, we've set up a debugging server that runs with your application that the browser can connect to in order to get information about what your application is doing. And if we look here, it tells us, use this debugging hotkey, Shift-Alt-D. All right, okay. So let's try it. Let's see what happens if I press Shift-Alt-D. Well, it opens a new window, and it says, ah, it's not going to work because the debugging server can't connect to your browser just yet because you're not listening for debug connections in this browser. So what you do is you copy this thing that it tells you about and close your browser, start it up using the instructions, and then this time, hopefully, the debug server will be listening. So if I press this tab here and then I start it up, then hopefully I can actually see not just the usual stuff that I see, not just the CSS and the HTML, but also the files from my project, the C Sharp files like here, and even the CSHTML files like here. Okay, And what's more, I can set breakpoints. So let's say I put a breakpoint here when we try to add an item to our to-do list. And just so we can see, let's split the windows. And then I'll try to add an item here. And when I do, it hits the breakpoint inside the browser. So that's pretty cool, right? We're able to do some .NET debugging inside the browser. Very good. But this is old news. This shipped months ago. Um, wouldn't it be nice if there was a way of doing the same debugging, but not inside the browser, but where your source code actually is inside Visual Studio? That's not been a thing that we've had support for. But it would be nice, wouldn't it? So let's see if we can make it work, shall we? Uh, I want to make Visual Studio connect to this browser. So I'm going to copy the URL, and I'm going to do attach to process, and I'm going to choose the Chrome DevTools protocol, and I'll put in the URL of my application. And VS will go and look, and it'll say, oh, yes, I've seen that you've got a Blazor application running inside the browser there. Um, so let's do that, shall we? So I'll double click on this thing, and VS will say, what kind of code would you like to debug? And you'll say, well, I'll choose the only thing that you're giving me the option to, uh, so I don't know why you're asking me. <laughs> and then I'll choose OK. And now VS is connected to the browser. And so now I'm going to try putting a breakpoint on my C Sharp code here inside the IDE. And then I'll type something in. Blah, and then I'll click my button, and we've paused. Bizarrely, it says Visual Studio Code. But if I switch over here, it's actually hit the breakpoint inside my IDE. So we've now got the IDE connected to the .NET runtime running on WebAssembly inside the browser, and we can actually debug. OK, so there's some things about debugging work right now, but most of them don't. As an example of something that does work, we've got this very cool thing where we can show you the call stack that goes uh, across different language types. So if we look at the bottom, you can see that when I click that button, it started by hitting a, a JavaScript event inside components.webassembly.js. That's how we know that the event happened. It goes through various layers inside JavaScript. It then goes through various layers inside WebAssembly before it finally lands on my C Sharp code. So you can debug calls that go from uh, C Sharp into JavaScript or from JavaScript back into C Sharp, and you can step through uh, the, uh, the chains of calls that go across languages like that. So that works really nicely. But most other things don't work. We're working on it, uh, and we will get some nice debugging as we go forwards. OK, so that's uh, where we're going next with debugging. Um, right, can we make our application start up any faster? Well, isn't it fast enough for you already? Let's have a look. OK, let's go to my home page here, and let's see how long it takes for my application to start up. So when I hit this button, we can see that it does that sort of progress bar thing, which is a bit weird, but it is doing it. And the reason why it takes about one second for it to start up is because this is the time where we're fetching mono, and we're starting it up, and we're starting your application up. And so we have to show a progress bar while that's happening. But you may think, you know what would be way cooler than a progress bar? What the user would like to see instead of a progress bar? The actual application, if you don't mind. That would be way cooler. <laughs> so how could we do that then? Well, we've got these components, right? And they run on WebAssembly. They run inside a browser. But they're .NET components. And we've got a .NET server. So if you think about it, couldn't we run these components on the server as well? And then we could render the application on the server, get its initial rendered HTML, send that to the browser, and then while the WebAssembly stuff is starting up, the user's already seeing the application UI. That would be a lot better than a progress bar. Let's see if we can do that then. So I'm going to go over to the thing that defines my HTML. Okay, You saw this in the browser earlier. You saw this is where we've got this uh, static HTML progress bar. I do not want to see this progress bar anymore. What I want to see instead of that 
is my actual application getting rendered. So I can say, all right then, we're going to render a component asynchronously. And the component I'm rendering is my entire application. Because remember, components are everything. Your whole application is a component. The page is a component. Layout's components. Everything's a component. And I've got a component called app, which is the whole thing. And that's what I want to render for whichever page you're currently on. OK? So let's see if this does its job correctly. So now I'm going to press reload. And let's see if we see a progress bar this time. We do not see a progress bar. That's a little better. How, how fast is this thing starting up? Let's go to a new browser tab. I'll put in the URL. I'll hit go. And ooh, my UI paused strangely there. But let's try that one more time. And then boom, it's really quick. OK? No progress bar. The application just comes up. It's still an interactive application because we've loaded the WebAssembly stuff in the background. OK? And if you want to quantify how fast this stuff is really getting rendered on the server, let's have a look inside the browser network tab here. And I'm going to hit reload again. OK. Oop. Right then, let's have a look. You'll see that we are rendering that initial HTML there in 26 milliseconds. So that is pretty fast. That is a lot faster than the one or two seconds that we were waiting before. And the actual overhead of rendering your Razor components is really close to zero. If you return a page that just returns hello world, it's basically the same. So the performance is really something I'm extremely happy with. So that is doing server-side pre-rendering to make your application start up near instantly, um, even while the WebAssembly stuff is loading in the background. And one of the cool things that you can do with that, although, I don't know, maybe you'll think this is not cool, but I kind of think it's cool in a sort of retro old school way, is what if we wanted to make a traditional server rendered application now? We didn't want any of this WebAssembly stuff. Let's just delete that script tag completely. What's going to happen now? OK, let's find out. So I'm going to go to this weather forecast page here, which is, was already running. When I hit reload, it's not going to load any WebAssembly stuff at all now. This is a pure server rendered application, like a traditional uh, MVC server side application that just returns HTML to the browser. If I look here, it looks kind of disgusting because we haven't sorted out all the formatting yet. But if you look closely, this is the HTML markup that all the components are generating. So it's a pure server rendered HTML application now. And some parts of it, still work. For example, any links, HTML links, still work. So I can navigate backwards and forwards through this list. But other things will not work. For example, my navigation menu will not work because that is built with an interactive component. So if you wanted to, you can use components for pure server-side rendering if you want. But honestly, that's not the best thing to do. Best thing is to make them be interactive as well. OK. Right then, last thing. Can we make our code run faster? Well, is it not fast already? How fast is it? Shall we try and have a way of quantifying how fast our code is actually executing? Well, that's why I've got this thing here called primes, all right? And we are going to be able to compute prime numbers, all right? Let's get the 10th prime number, that's 29. Let's get the 1,000th prime number, OK? Let's have the 10,000th prime number. It's like 100,000 something. And it's taken us 360 milliseconds to compute that. OK, why did it take that long? Well, let's have a look at the code for this. Uh, I'm going to look at this component called primes. And it's got this text field while you type in which prime you want. It's got a button that's going to submit to this calculate method here. And calculate is going to call a method on a library that I've written called supermaths. And that is maths, not math for the Americans, um, dot primes dot compute nth prime. OK, and if we look at the code inside there, uh, it's a very, very brain-dead simple algorithm. It's just going to do absolute brute force. It's going to consider for all the numbers, is it prime, by checking all the possible divisors. And then you know, we're just going to keep doing that until we get to whichever one that you asked for. Very, very simple and quite computationally expensive. And we see that it takes about 350 milliseconds here. Now, if we compare that in uh, running it natively, how fast is it going to be? So to find out, I've created a normal console app here called normal console app. And if we look in the program main of that, you'll see it calls the same thing. It calls the same compute nth prime thing. So let's set that as our startup project and run it and see how fast this stuff really should be. Okay, It should be able to do this in like 
12 or 13 milliseconds if it's running under JIT compiled native code. And so it's not super, honestly, that it's taking 360 milliseconds. We've got this like factor of 20 or 30 slowdown going on there. And in fact, it's significantly worse still if we go over into Chrome. Let's see what it's like here in Chrome world. Okay, let's make sure I've got my application started up. Uh, give me the 10,000th prime, please. Go. And we're waiting. Ah, oh. okay, so it's done it, but it's taken a, a rather terrifying almost two seconds to do that. Why is it so slow then? The reason this is so much slower is because when we're running your .NET code on the Mono WebAssembly runtime, we're actually interpreting it. We're not JIT compiling it because this is something that is extremely difficult to do under WebAssembly. Maybe we'll get there. But that's not what we're doing yet. All right. So this might seem kind of terrifying that we've got such a massive slowdown. Now, as for how much of a problem this is, it depends what kind of app you're building. We've designed Blazor to be able to produce really rich and sophisticated UIs that update faster than humans can perceive it, um, even when you get to very complex UIs. So uh, I'm reasonably confident that you can build something big and complex, and your users are just going to regard it as being updating instantly, uh, because we've got this very optimized UI code path. But if you want to do something CPU intensive, obviously it's not such a rosy scenario. But there are ways that we can make this better. So what if instead of running on an interpreter, we were able to compile your .NET code to bare metal WebAssembly ahead of time and then execute that in the browser instead of running it through an interpreter. And that is something that the Mono team has been hard work at for quite a while, and they're pretty close to being ready with this. So I'm going to show you a little example right now. This is just a proof of concept that's separate from what, what the Mono team has done, just to give you an idea of what the developer experience might be like. So I'm going to look at my project file here for myapp.client. That's the Blazor application here. And you can see that this is where we're referencing super maths. And I'm going to put a little bit of extra instructions here to say, when we reference that, I don't want to load it as a .NET DLL. I want to, ahead of time, compile it. Okay? And then, just because this is a hacky prototype I've put together, I'm going to have to go to my index CSHTML and put in a reference for this other thing, the AOT loader that, that I've made. All right, so now, when we compile this, the application is going to be a little different because some of it is going to be ahead of time compiled. So let's reload here inside the browser. And I'm going to look inside the browser dev tools here. Uh, because what I want you to see is that if we look in this framework directory with all the WebAssembly stuff, we've not just got mono.wasm, we've now also got supermaths.wasm, where we've compiled the .NET assembly to native bytecode. And if I look in that, uh, OK, so I have to refresh to see it. But if I refresh, then we look in there. You can see this is the WebAssembly translation of our .NET code. And we've exported this function, compute nth prime, and the implementation of it in just native WebAssembly has been generated right there. OK, but is it actually any faster? Shall we find out? So let's say if I want the 10th prime, well, that uh, takes no time at all by the time we've got it running. If we want the 10,000th prime, is it still going to take 300 milliseconds? It now takes 18, 19 milliseconds. So we've had a fantastic speed increase, very, very close to the 13, 14 milliseconds that we're getting when running natively. And in fact, it's even better if we go over into Chrome and we try to get that one there. So give me the 10,000th prime, and it's going to come back in 10 milliseconds. So it's actually faster than running natively now. Well, not really. OK, that's, that's hugely misleading. The most biggest way in which this is misleading is I'm running in debug mode here. If I ran with release optimizations, the native one would be a bit faster, but not much faster. So my point with this is not to say which one is faster out of WebAssembly or native. The point is just to say that with AOT compilation, it's completely reasonable for your .NET code to run approximately the same speed or within the ballpark of the same speed of running natively. So you can do super CPU intensive stuff if you want to. Though hopefully you don't even need to if you're just doing UI stuff. OK, so there is some stuff that is coming soon that we have not shipped yet. OK, so we're getting close to running out of time now. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. If you were in Dan's talk this morning, you saw this before. Uh, these components that we're building, they're designed to work in multiple environments. So I've shown you these components running inside the browser on WebAssembly, updating the DOM directly. Uh, we've got a feature that's going to ASP.NET Core 3.0. 
uh, which is a, you know, a committed shipping production thing, where you can run the same components that work under WebAssembly, and you can execute them on the server in an interactive mode where all of the execution lives on the server, and the browser doesn't see any WebAssembly at all. And all the updates take place over a real-time WebSocket connection, which is super uh, if you want to make a very thin client. So you've got low-end devices that you want to run your components. Well, you run them on the server, and you just push the UI updates over the channel. Uh, it gives you access to the full .NET runtime and can simplify your code in various ways. It also has some drawbacks, like you can't do this offline. The client-side applications can work truly offline if you want them to, um, but the ones that run on the server, they can't because you know, it's using the server to actually update the UI. You've also got the latency between the, uh, you know, the browser and the server, and you're using up your server resources. But pros and cons, and they're good for different scenarios. The final thing, uh, the final case where you can run these components uh, that's not client-side or server-side, um, you might be thinking, well, hang on, client-side and server-side? That's the whole universe, isn't it? There's, not, there's no other side to this. Uh, but there is another side to it, which is what if you want to write a native desktop application with something like Electron? Well, you can run the same components there as well, and we can update the, um, the UI directly inside Electron. To give you a very rapid example of that, uh, we did a little uh, work exercise to try porting the Azure Storage Explorer application to run inside Blazor on Electron. So this is the Azure Storage Blexplorer, and it is a Blazor a set of Blazor components running inside Electron. So we've used the same web technologies that you've seen me use, and we can make something that you know, looks and feels just like a native application. We've got this grid with 100,000 rows in it. We've got tabs. We've got native right-click menus. Uh, we can do uh, network access. We can interact with things like uh, operating system services. So for example, let's see what Andrew Nurse has been put into these blob stores. I can open this item here, and that's going to show up as a, you know, inside the native Windows image editor. Um, so we can interact with the operating system properly from Electron. So point of showing you all that is, this component model that we're giving you now is designed to be incredibly flexible. It can run under WebAssembly, it can run on the server, it can run on Electron, and your same UI components can work in all of those places. So. That is all I'm going to have time to show you. Uh, if you want to try out Blazor, I'd recommend you do so. There's a lot to learn. Uh, we've got some documentation site. There's lots of good community projects that are uh, springing up around Blazor and the whole ASP.NET Core components system. So you should go and try them out. To do that, you should go to blazor.net. And that'll give you all the instructions about how to set things up. And you can try that out and you know, make yourself a happier and more productive person. So that's all. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Remember to evaluate this session.